So this is episode 7 of Joel chapter 3, the second part of chapter 3. Here's Joel preaching to Judah, he comes after Obadiah and before Amos. So you can do a recap here, you can pause and read this. In chapter 1, part 1 was Judah's locust plague, part 2 was Judah must repent. Chapter 2, first part was Assyrian invaders and chapter 2, Yahweh responds to them. And you can pause and read this. Chapter 3, the nations judged. God says, nations prepare for judgment. Nations prepare for war. And nations prepare for your defeat. So you can pause and read this detail if you want to. So Joel has a three-pronged approach to illustrate his key idea, the day of the Lord. Chapter 1, the immediate day of the Lord, which was the plague of locusts. Chapter 2, the imminent day of the Lord, the invading army threat. And chapter 3, where we are now, the final day of the Lord, uh, which is the battle of Armageddon, and the vindication of Israel, God blesses his people. So let's dive into chapter 3. I'm repeating this from the first part, verse 16. The Lord will roar from Zion and thunder from Jerusalem. The earth and the heavens will tremble, but the Lord will be a refuge for his people, a stronghold for the people of Israel. And now we start, verse 17. Then you will know that I, the Lord your God, dwell in Zion, my holy hill. Jerusalem will be holy. Never again will foreigners invade her. Then you will know. Everything will change when the Lord comes back in that day. Jerusalem will once again be a holy city. Israel will be a restored land. The people will be cleansed and the glorious King of Kings will reign. I, the Lord your God, dwell in Zion. The Lord himself will live among his people. This holy city will have God's abiding presence. Then the city will not only be holy again, but impregnable. Mount Zion, on which Jerusalem was built and the temple stood, was special because it was the place that God chose for his own dwelling. Psalm 132 says, For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling place. Jerusalem will be holy. Jerusalem is called a holy city at least 11 times in scripture, and you can check some of these. Even today, Jerusalem is still called a holy city, but like every other city in the world, Jerusalem is also inhabited by sinners doing wicked things. But after the day of the Lord, Jerusalem will be cleansed of all unrighteousness and will truly be a holy city wherein God dwells. Never again will foreigners invade her. Foreigners does not just mean people of other lands. It means people of foreign gods, pagans. God is saying on his holy mountain, there will be no other gods, no paganism, never again. The only worship will be to the one true God. For thousands of years, pagan nations trampled Jerusalem. Persians, Assyrians, Babylonians, Greeks, Romans, Arabs, Turks, Egyptians, Crusaders, the UN, and others. These nations sought to overrun Israel and take God's abundant blessings for themselves. God promises foreigners will never again breach Israel's borders and occupy her land. Verse 18. In that day the mountains will drip new wine and the hills will flow with milk. All the ravines of Judah will run with water. A fountain will flow out of the Lord's house and will water the valley of Acacia. In that day. If we haven't figured it out already... We are reminded that Joel is prophesying about the end times, the final day of the Lord. We know that over the centuries, Israel has been ravaged by wars and famines and droughts and invasions and occupied by people with no covenant relationship with God. But change is coming. Judgment means many will be condemned while others will be vindicated. The mountains, the mountains will drip with new wine. When we see the word mountains, we should immediately think worship. Not the high places of pagan worship, but God's holy mountain, Zion. New wine, milk, and water. So it says the, the mountains will drip with new wine, the hills will flow with milk, all the ravines will run with water. God is the God of restoration, everything made new. Wine is symbolic of joy and happiness and thanksgiving. It's one of the offerings of the temple. While wine is joy, milk is sustenance, provision, nourishment. The order here is important. Wine first, then milk. Once we find joy in the Lord, 
then we are sustained, not the other way around. We need to be grateful to God, to praise Him and to worship Him, because He and His power is the source of our joy. Nehemiah says, Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Ravines of Judah will run with water. Water is synonymous with blessings. Without water, man can only live for a few days, not weeks or months, but only days. All of earth needs water. The land, vegetation, animals, insects, livestock, and man. Water is the liquid of life. In previous chapters, we saw this was cut off. But now Joel gives a glimpse of the future abundance and prosperity of Israel, like the original lushness of the Garden of Eden. Fountains of water will refresh the people and the land. Isaiah 51 says, For the Lord will comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places. He will make her wilderness like Eden and a desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in it, thanksgiving and the voice of melody. In Joel chapter 1, the people were weeping and wailing because they had no food, thanks to the locust plague. But now the people will experience joy and gladness and thanksgiving. A fountain will flow out of the Lord's house, that's the temple. Jerusalem is the only city of antiquity that wasn't built near a great river. Rome had the Tiber, Nineveh had the Tigris, Babylon was on the Euphrates, and Egyptian cities were along the Nile. But in the end times, a great river will flow from the newly built third temple out of the Lord's house of Jerusalem. And this millennial river will issue from under the temple, and it won't be a seasonal stream, but a perennial river. And you can see here it is issuing right out of the temple and then splitting up to the east and the west. Zechariah 14 says, And in that day it shall be that living waters shall flow from Jerusalem, half of them towards the eastern sea, half of them towards the western sea, in both summer and winter it shall occur. So here's a little map where we have the temple and half of the river will flow to the Dead Sea east on the east and the other half will flow to the Mediterranean Sea on the west. Ezekiel 47, Then he brought me back to the door of the temple, And there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple toward the east, for the front of the temple faced east. And the water was flowing from under the right side of the temple, south of the altar. Right out of the temple. Isn't that glorious? The Valley of Acacias. What's the significance of acacia wood? The Ark of the Covenant was made from acacia wood, overlaid with gold. This is a clear reference to the Ark. And inside the ark are Moses' tablets of the Ten Commandments that teaches us how to enjoy life and blessings, not curses and death, if we follow the commandments. Since acacia trees thrive in a desert-type environment, we know that the land was dry. But in that day, fountains will flow and the desert will become a well-watered land. The desert will blossom and bloom. Verse 19, But Egypt will be desolate, Edom a desert waste, because of the violence done to the people of Judah, in whose land they shed innocent blood. Egypt and Edom. As punishment, the heathen nation surrounding and threatening Israel will be a wilderness, a wasteland in that day. These are ancient enemies of God's people, but now they will be no more. This chapter of Joel is all within the context of redemption, and the Passover that took place in Egypt is the ultimate symbol of deliverance and redemption. Because of the violence done to the people of Judah. Egypt will be desolate for 40 years. Just one tenth of the time that Egypt enslaved Israel. Almost like God is demanding a tithe from Egypt. Remember Joseph had moved his family to Goshen in eastern Egypt during the seven years of famine. But after Joseph's death, instead of returning to Israel, his family stayed in Goshen. Eventually they were enslaved by the pharaohs. But in that day, in the future... Egypt will be punished. Ezekiel 29 says, Indeed, therefore, I am against you and against your rivers, and I will make the land of Egypt utterly waste and desolate. Now the foot of man shall pass through it, nor foot of beast pass through it, and it shall be uninhabited forty years. I will make the land of Egypt desolate in the midst of the countries that are desolate, and among the cities that are laid waste. Her city shall be desolate forty years, and I will scatter the Egyptians. Edom of desert waste. 
Egypt would have restoration after 40 years, but not Edom. Throughout the book of Joel, there's been no emphasis on Edom. But here at the very end of Joel, suddenly God speaks of Edom. Why? Because Edom specifically would be utterly destroyed forever for their bitterness toward the Jews. This hatred started in the womb when the twins, Jacob and Esau, struggled to be the firstborn. You can read their life from the story in Genesis 25 on. Jacob married within the Jewish tribe, but Esau in rebellion married Canaanite women, which was an abomination to his Jewish parents. So this is an account of Esau, the father of the Edomites, in the area of Mount Seir. So this, I got this picture. It says, ain't nothing new under the sun. This is Mount Seir, Petra in Mount Seir. And here's Rome, Great Britain, and the White House, all with the same Edomite structure, architecture. Isn't that a scary thought? So Jacob was in God's covenant line, whereas Esau was not. Esau became the father of the pagan Edomite tribe and had everlasting hatred of Jacob and his lineage, the Jews. Edom is the example for how God brings down all arrogant and violent nations. Edom refused to let Moses and his people travel through Edom on the king's highway when God delivered them from Egypt. They even sent an army to prevent Moses' travel. This made God even more angry and he promised to punish them. So here's... uh, Moses, they traveled this way. They were at Kadesh Barnea, and then God had them wandering around the wilderness for 40 years. Then when God said it's time to move on, they wanted to cross over um, the Jordan River and go into to the, to the east side of the Jordan. But Edom wouldn't let them pass through because here's the Edomites. They own this whole land. So they forced Moses and all of those people, millions of people, to go all the way down, all the way up around Edom. And so God was really angry with the Edomites about that and he promised to punish them. They shed innocent blood. All throughout the Old Testament, Edom is either fighting Judah or forming alliances with Judah's adversaries. Because Edom makes a point to shed innocent blood in the land of Judah, God takes retribution on Edom. And you know, you can do a whole study of just of the Edomites and how much they hated the Jews and, and went after them. I mean, it's just unbelievable. So the Edomites were violent. There are two words in Hebrew for violence. One word means violence with a purpose, which doesn't mean it's justified, it just you did violence with a purpose. And the other Hebrew word means violence for the sake of violence. Inflicting demonic pain and suffering and rejoicing over the misery of others. The Hebrew word for this violence is Hamas. So this is an end times prophecy which is also echoed in Obadiah. Through Obadiah, God declared judgment over Edom that she would be obliterated from history. Today, there's no country called Edom. Babylon overran Edom 100 years after Obadiah prophesied, and they never recovered. Jesus said the Edomites, like King Herod, who was an Edomite, he called himself king of the Jews, but he wasn't even Jewish, he was an Edomite. And the Pharisees, who were selected by the Romans to be the clergy, they weren't of the line of Aaron, So the Edomites and the Pharisees, they call, Jesus said, they call themselves Jews but are liars. They are of the synagogue of Satan. That's a condemnation. So there's judgment upon the nations from Ezekiel 25. The Ammonites, the Boabites, and the Edomites, and they're over here on this eastern side of the River Jordan. The Ammonites, the Moabites, and the kingdom of Edom. And Philistia, which is the Philistines, and their primary city, uh, city was Gaza, so the, the city of the giants, the Philistines. Tyre and Sidon was Phoenicians, the Phoenicians city, that were the great sailors of the world. Here's Tyre and Sidon. God was going to wipe them out. God was going to wipe them out. And all of this whole side get wiped out. And, of course, Egypt. God was mad at Egypt. So when uh, God says there's a judgment upon the nations, pretty much you can see this is Israel and Judah back in the day. Um, once, you know, David combined the two, but then they split up after King Solomon died. Um, but you can see they're completely surrounded by angry Muslim nations. Obadiah 1 says, Thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You shall be greatly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who dwell in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high. You who say in your heart, who will bring me down to the ground? Though you ascend as high as the eagle, and though you set your nest among the stars, from there 
I will bring you down, says the Lord. God will remove all life sustaining blessings from Egypt and Edom in sharp contrast to the land of lushness that Israel will enjoy. Numbers 24, Balaam predicted, and Edom shall be a possession while Israel does valiantly. So Edom has been ignored throughout history, but in the end times they resurface. Actually, not really ignored because they are constantly, they are ignored by God, but they are constantly fighting the Jews. So God's not finished with Edom. They are not in the past, they are in the future. When Jesus the Messiah returns, the first place he goes to is Edom, the descendants of Esau. So Esau despised his birthright and sold it to Jacob for a minimal pot of soup. But the birthright is not just for the recipient, it's also to be a blessing to others. But Esau was self-centered. He is not interested in blessing others. However, Jacob was, and Jacob did honor the birthright blessing of the firstborn. So he bought the birthright from Esau in a legal, legitimate transaction of sale. And then Jacob legally owned the blessing that came with it. The birthright and the blessings are one and the same thing. You can't have the one without the other. So when Jacob told Isaac, I am Esau, Legally, he was allowed to say that because he owned the birthright. A opiate his statement came with subterfuge. He had to cover himself in hair because he knew his father knew that Jacob was hairless, whereas Esau had hair, or the hairy man. Ezekiel 32, there is Edom, her kings and all her princes, who despite their might are laid beside those slain by the sword. They shall lie with the uncircumcised and with those who go down to the pit. So here's the judgment against Edom. The judgment against Edom is mentioned in more Old Testament books than it is against any other foreign nation. God really didn't like them. So here are a couple of verses. You can go and check some and see uh, if you're interested in the deep dive. Verse 20. Judah will be inhabited forever and Jerusalem through all generations. Judah will be inhabited forever. What good is it to have a restored land but still have a sinful population? God's people must be cleansed before they can enter into the promised kingdom. God promises to cleanse his people and their land as Israel experiences a national salvation in that day. Zechariah 13 says, In that day a fountain shall be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem, for sin and for uncleanness. It shall be in that day, says the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols from the land and they shall no longer be remembered. I will also cause the prophets and their unclean spirit to depart from the land. Ezekiel 36 says, For I will take you among the nations, gather you out of all the countries, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. And Judah will be inhabited forever. Through all generations. In contrast to Egypt and Edom, Judah will be inhabited forever. The new millennium will last a thousand years of peace and unprecedented abundance. When God's judgment and redemption takes place, his kingdom will flourish forever. Daniel 7 says, Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Jesus will be seated on his throne to fulfill God's promise to King David of an everlasting dynasty. And we, the saints, will spend eternity with God in the kingdom of heaven. Verse 21. Shall I leave their innocent blood unavenged? No, I will not. The Lord dwells in Zion. God has two options. He will cleanse or not cleanse. Why does God end this prophecy in this way? The main theme of the book of Joel is redemption, which is related to Passover. Through the ten plagues of Egypt, God gave everyone, Jew and Gentile, Jew and Egyptian, the option to be cleansed and forgiven or not. And some Egyptians looked at Goshen, where things were good, and compared it to Egypt, which was suffering under the ten plagues, and they moved to Goshen. And then they left when the Jews left. And this is how Joel's prophecy ends. Do you want redemption or not? It's a very simple choice. God wants us to have salvation. God does not want his magnificent creation, which is us, mankind, destroyed because we reject him. The Messiah is the Redeemer. If you want redemption, then choose the Lamb of God. 
If you don't, then reject the Lamb of God. It's your personal choice, and so are the consequences of your choice. If the choice is redemption, God will cleanse the blood guilt of the nations that persecuted God's people. That would include the global shame of mass genocide of Christians over the ages and still ongoing today. So I typed genocide of Christians into Google, and I've got all of these choices. And amazingly, none of them include China. And in China today, you're a living, walking, breathing, working Christian, and the Chinese the CCP will pick you up, trot you off to hospital, and while you're still alive, they'll take your organs out because you're a Christian and they don't respect Christians. Massive genocide of Christians going on in China, and yet Google didn't give me that option. So it's the global shame of mass genocide of Christians. The Lord dwells in Zion. This book of judgment started with a tragedy, the invasion of the locusts, but it ends on a triumphant and promising note, the Lord dwells in Zion. Therefore all those that called on his name and were saved will live with him in glory eternally. What a glorious kingdom that will be. Revelation 11 the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Matthew 6, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Revelation 22, surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Revelation explains how there's this river that runs has got trees on either side bearing fruit continually and different 12 different fruits all the time it's just i'm looking forward to that you'll find me if you're looking for me in heaven you'll find me sitting under the lychee tree or the lychee tree however you pronounce it episode 7 chapter 3b god pours out his blessing so this is the end of this if you want god to bless you bless others and the best blessing you can get is salvation and this is my favorite blessing the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine in you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Number six. So today the scripture we should be most alert to with respect to modern Israel is Genesis 12. I will bless those who bless you, says God, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed, which is the blessing that came with the birthright. Like it or not, Israel is an anointed nation, and when we partner with them, we share in the bounty of God. Thank you for spending this time with me for seven episodes of Joel. This is the end of Joel, and so God bless you. Shalom.